Okay, welcome, 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 part two. Um, we are now going to begin with the attendance. Um, Chad, do you wanna do the attendance or do you wanna check? Oh, I'd love to do the attendance. Lovely. Mike. Here. Oh yeah, Dan. Hello, Re. I'm present. Naomi, I believe is on her way. Uh, Stephanie. She online. No. Um, Alan. Present. Shalom. Chad. Here. Gabe. Not present. James. Present. Hello. Alex. Here. Yo. Taylor. Hi. Paul. I am here. Can you hear me? Hello. Excellent. Excellent. We have quorum at present time, and Naomi will come shortly. Um, we'll move on to the approval of the agenda. Does anybody have anything they'd like to add or subtract? James. Um, I would just like to strike section one of new business. Um, I realize that we still haven't had time to really talk about it, and Dean Ragland is out of town, so I haven't been able to talk about it either. So I just want more time on that, so I will strike that for now. Okay. And since it is your item, we're just going to remove that. Um, uh, ooh, Taylor, I forgot your name. Um, I would like us to add, um, I guess, the new number four to new business for discussion on what the rest of the our term is going to look like. So awesome. Is anybody opposed to this item being added? Wonderful. So moved. Is there anything else we would like to add to the agenda? Is anyone opposed to the agenda with these new additions? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. On to chair updates. Chad. All right, chair updates. Um, Taylor and I, we sat in on a provost uh, listening session as far as um, what students are looking for for uh, um, the new provost, uh, as well as some of the conversation was circling the student life experience on campus uh, to help them uh, put together a job description that will be a little more robust to, to collect um, a, or to find a better or a new provost. Um, and they also asked us that if there is anything that you can think of um, as far as uh, what the new provost should know, or if you have any nominations for the provost, say email this email, which I'm going to put in the uh, the main chat here. So uh, please consider that. Thank you, Chad. On to Taylor with other updates. Um, so today was the first of two trainings that I have organized with the new incoming council. Only three people came, but we had a blast. We went over governing documents and how to lead a meeting um, I'm also really excited for Food for Finals for next week. That is next Tuesday and Wednesday, 7.30 to 12.30. If you have not put your name on the sign-up sheet, please do so. It looks like we have a bit more people on Tuesday than Wednesday. So if you have the capacity to go on Wednesday, that would be beautiful. I also want to mention that next week you know, on Thursday is the last President's Cabinet meeting for our term, and the amazing Stephanie Didier is going to go and represent student government for us. Um, that is all the updates from the chairs on to SACAB. So um, I was not at SACAB today. Um, Stephanie was. Um, I have an update afterwards, but Stephanie, you want to give the update for SACAB? Um, we didn't have quorum, so we weren't able to really do any official business. We were able to listen to two of our presenters that came in um, that were discussing um, possible murals being implemented um, on campus in the near future. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, also, just an announcement to everyone, SACAB, um, I'm officially, um, the last day SACAB will meet will be, um, I've said as um, May 19th. Um, so next week, we're having a, our last business meeting, finishing up everything else for the school year, and then um, that 19th um, will just be kind of like a small little kind of onboarding day, a little party. We'll have some some, some sweets and some coffee um, with all the new SACAB reps. And you guys are, of course, invited if you wish to come. So thank you.
Wonderful. On to Board of Trustees with Gabe. <gasps> Hello, friend. Um, I have no update. No update. Thank you, Gabe. On to Budget Committee with Mike. Um, I have no updates from Budget Committee. Mike. Thank you, Mike. On to Sustainability with Taylor and Alex. Uh, Taylor has no updates. Alex. I have no updates either. Wonderful. On to the Judiciary Committee with James. Okay, hi everybody. I'm just going to quickly go over something that's kind of like uh, personal. Uh, just an announcement that we passed in our chat Amendment 9. Um, this was collaborated with me and Taylor. Uh, all this amendment did was ensure that our uh, terms end on June 1st or midnight of March 31st. Uh, that was just because at the time we had to where our inauguration would be the end of our terms and we had it a month early. So that has been passed for anyone who was not able to see from the public. Uh, but that's it for that. Uh, but as far as for the Judiciary Committee itself, um, we are we talked about Paul's request to discuss the issues going on in the uh, Indigenous Student Resource Committee. And I was able to talk to a couple of different members. I haven't been able to talk to Alex, and that's my fault because I forgot he was in there. So I will also discuss with him. Uh, but what we've received from this is that the committee has not been meeting in several weeks. I think at this point it might have been two months now. Um, and that there's not much communication going on in the committee uh, amongst all the members. And so our biggest recommendation from the judiciary is either one, we just dissolve this committee since it doesn't seem that there's much work going on from the entire committee, just one member. Um, and they continue to do that work and give us personal updates in the um, open floor announcements. Or we just allow this committee to stand up until the end of our term and then the next council can decide whether or not they keep it. Uh, that is pretty much the recommendations that we as a council have. I also know Paul told me that he would like to see some restructuring, um, either like a new chair or at least more people to join in. So that way that there is more work cultivated in this committee. So those are the first two recommendations and then a recommendation from Paul himself. Great. On to TSEC PR committee. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> next big event that everybody should be aware of is the... Uh, um, food for finals, Tuesday, Wednesday, May 9 and 10 from 8 a.m. to uh, noon. Uh, we have catering. We're going to have uh, some people doing neck and shoulder massages for our students. Uh, we've pretty much ironed out all of the details on that. Just a few other things. Um, I, after this meeting, am going to go and print a boatload of flyers because I realized I have not done that at all. Um, and there will be a couple of flyer stacks around the office. If anybody is willing to like take a stack and put them around, that would be so helpful. Um, yeah. And then that's all that I have. Mm -hmm. What about social media? I have not posted on social media yet, but I will. Yes. Cool. Thank you for that update. On to the Policy Advisory Committee with Ree. None of the faculty led committees that um, where I'm representing us have met. They are done for the year, so I have nothing for policy advisory committee nor faculty student affairs for this week. Thank you, Ree. On to the Indigenous Student Resource Committee. Uh, oh. OK, yeah, uh, no updates as of right now. Um, I've been doing more responsibilities as the NISA member uh, advocating in or not advocating. Well, um, just doing work to get the powwow ready for Saturday. But you guys shall come out if you guys haven't already seen the post. 11 to 6, fried bread. We're going to have ice cream, all kinds of other food vendors. Um, and yeah, so just come up and show out. Can you say the time again? At 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it'll be in the athletics department in the gymnasium. Thank you. Um, on to the cross-functionality task force. Um, I'll let Paul do this one since I have been, been able to go. Yeah, so I'll admit they, they changed the meeting times to a time where I can't go. Um, so it might help if there's another council member that's interested in participating in this process, but I, uh, I'm i still taking part in the team's discussion and watching what's going on in the team's channel. And I've shared a PowerPoint uh, with a lot of, um, just a lot of results and, and stuff that kind of break down what's what's been seen about the process and kind of where it broke down when the workload reduction was brought to, um, to the board. Um, yeah, so just check that out, folks. I'll keep this short. Thank you, Paul. On to the open floor announcements. Yes, Dan?
Um, so I went to the meeting, um, what was it, for the president's cabinet's meeting. Um, there was a lot of stuff there that was interesting, cool, whatever. One of the things that I think really stood out to me and I don't think is fair and I think maybe should be also brought to attention and we can either discuss or see what we can do about it um, or ask the students what they want done about it is that when they did the day of giving, they had like 1,500 donors and 900 of those donors do donated to the athletics department and things that had to do with athletics. I don't think that's fair and I don't think that's cool. And I think that it's cool that like, yeah, the athletics department's getting all this money and advocacy work and that's great. But what about other departments? What about psychology? What about English? What about multiculture? What about STEM? There's so many other departments that that could have been spread out to. And yes, the donors have the choice to do what they want with their money. Obviously, it's their money. But how can we push on the day of giving to really have those numbers be distributed more evenly throughout the departments? Because that's really kind of putting other students at a disadvantage, and that's not fair. Thank you, Naomi. Um, on to, to Paul, then Dan. Thank you. So I wanted to quickly say um, in response to what Naomi just brought up, uh, that I think one of the reasons why they had such success in the athletics department was I believe they raffled off a Nintendo Switch. And I, I think that's part of what really drove a lot of the participation in there. And I think that's something that we could potentially learn from insofar as like, um, if we were to have some sort of like hot item like that, what might just cost us, you know, 300 bucks to uh, get started could actually earn us, I think they had had over $10,000 from that fundraiser. So um, it, it, it could net us a positive um, boost in fundraising um, if we if we maybe take a page out of their book into the future. But I agree with a lot of, of what Naomi was saying, not to detract from anything that was said. Um, two other things I wanted to say is, um, you know, in recognition of a lot of the different types of swag we've acquired, um, I believe that uh, we've violated the resolution CR 2210 by ordering swag from non-unionized workforces. This goes against the sustainable and eth ethical principles outlined in the resolution, and it undermines the democratic process and trust of the student body. Moving forward, we need to operate differently and ensure that all purchases align with the values and principles set forth in these resolutions that we write to promote transparency and accountability. We need to be accountable to the stuff we pass as a group. Uh, no one person on this council can decide not to do something that we've, as a group, decided is the course of action we're going to take. I believe that was part of a compromise that I made with those who wrote the resolution, and I was really disappointed to see that we got a lot of like stuff that who knows where it was made, who knows if it was made by children or if it was made by people who had any any sort of living wage or any sort of decent working conditions. Uh, this is part of why I fought for that in that resolution, and I'm a little bummed that it um, didn't see fruit. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say is that I think it's a problem that the resolution that we wrote in support of the First Amendment rights of the Tampa Five was not shared with the student body and was not posted on our website. Uh, I believe the decision to not do so undermines the transparency and accountability of our organization and prevents students from being informed and engaged in what we're doing. It's important that we all uphold our hand to democracy and transparency by sharing all our resolutions and actions with the student body. Moving forward, we need to ensure that all our work is accessible and visible to the student body. Nothing we should, nothing we do should be in the dark. Um, and effectively, by doing it in that way, we have kind of kept that in the dark. So that's everything I have. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. On to Dan. Check, check. Dear Council, as many of you ha have noticed, as you have, may have noticed, I've been absent, non-existent rather, nearly this entire semester. This was intentional on my part. It really was a waste of my precious time. It is no secret, as I have told many individuals, I am simply collecting a paycheck, as the Dean of Students Office only pays me for a fraction of the work I do on behalf of the MSU Denver student body. So to reiterate, I am actively advocating for MSU Denver students, both present and those for seven generations to come, just not in this body, as it has become unwelcoming from my perspective. As many of you know, I am working in the Dean of Students Office to develop a national model for prison and community reentry higher education programs that will, will be lobbied at both state and federal uh, legislators in hope to work towards a national standard for after an individual pays their time for their crime, they will have a chance in higher education. A paradigm shift is, it, is in order and its conception is occurring here at MSU Denver. This university is truly amazing and at the forefront on all facets. If you have any questions or would like to be a part of this budding community of inclusion, let me know. I'll get you plugged in. Now, 
The reason I've had no interest in SGT SAC this semester is because I feel that everything came crashing down for me, reputation included, included due to standing up for Mr. Allen, Allen Williams' right to have and speak his opinion. This semester's business has been consumed by nonsense. Although we have done great work, it has been primarily focused on quelling a counselor's freedom of speech. So lame and not democratic at all. This whole ordeal threw me out of balance and I'm not thrilled. No problem though, it's no hill for a climber. It is a constitutional right that is so sacred for each of us, so sacred some may not be aware of how and in what way. So let me explain. By me standing up for Alan, I was being a true advocate. I was not standing up for what he said, but for his right to say it. Even if an individual has to, what an individual has to say is hateful, which let me make clear for the record, Alan's language was not an actuality, rather an interpretation. At best, his language was culturally insensitive and ignorant, at worst, partly true. But this is not for me to decide at this juncture in my life. If the politicians on the right in our country that control the US House decide to limit political opinion or any speech that was against their morals, as Paul attempted to do a few weeks back, Paul, Naomi, Gabe, Taylor, Mike, Kenny, Alex, their voices will be silenced first. You know that's true, and that makes me angry. TSAC is tasked with advocating for all MSU Denver students, all means all, not simply those who align with us in totality or even partiality. Advocating for diversity means standing up for all my people, and that is every single human on this planet, no matter what, guaranteed. And in my capacity as a student counselor, that means every MSU Denver student. I have very little tact and have a ruthless spirit for standing up for what is right and will continue to do so throughout my life, utilizing any legal mechanism available to expose things that need to be exposed and derided at the surface, even if they are counter to my personal beliefs. Because of what has occurred within this body over the last few months, I now am apolitical and am once again fully invested in what I've been pushing for and working towards the last decade. Liberation for all people, total freedom, not theatrical stunts at the expense of other people. I have no modesty, which manifests in no embarrassment and a willingness to stand solitary in my beliefs and life path while being in communion with humans of all kinds. By me standing up for Alan's right to say whatever he did is directly, if not indirectly, standing up for the Native Indigenous community, the LGBTQIA plus community, and the BIPOC community, and so many more valuable communities that we could not do without in this country that, that I can name here. And Paul, don't get Marx, Marxist and Maoist educated into fa becoming a fascist. You're close and dancing a slippery slope. Thank you, Council, and the entire MSU Denver community. I'm truly grateful for this institution and the doors it opened for me. I hope all students can experience the growth I have while attending MSU Denver. Long into the future, regardless of the situation or geographic location, I will be a strong champion for this university and its one-of-a-kind staff, faculty, janitors, students, advocates, and real magical human beings fighting for every student that reaches out in need and those who do not. All students, take Dr. Barone for example. Please counsel, I have one request. Whatever you do, find at least one thing in every one of your colleagues on the council next term that you admire. So that's 11 traits total, no problem. And work to emulate them into your daily patterns of behavior to find common ground, consensus building, or at least, or at the very least, acknowledge and nurtures, nurture everyone's humanity. Set aside your subjective beliefs, both those about each colleague, but also what you've heard, assumed to be true, gossip consumed is someone about someone intertwined into your busy daily activities as a scholar, human friend, family member, club officer, and all that you do. The list of identities in this room is, if you think about it, enormous. All of the identities, I mean all of them, each of us embodies, whether conscious or not conscious, privilege, is valid. Yeah. And, Dan, no, hold on, and, that is the way it will be in every room we enter for the rest of our lives. Armando and Roy taught me something I will never forget. Each person we encounter, advocate for, lead, or yell at, ignore, silence, make feel uncomfortable, irregardless of intent, are therefore, but aren't silent for when we should be, has with them, intertwined in them, biologically encoded throughout them, the entirety of their individual lived experience. And that experience, all of ours, and every human's, and the experience every human has is valuable. Good work, all of you, for your tremendous effort. Thank you. Thank you for the update, Dan. The rest of the counselors list, please remember to keep the rest of these announcements and updates as such. Um, Re, then Paul. Hi, just quickly wanted to say, as a general statement and lessons learned for this year, that 
going forward, our new council, we want to make sure that we remember our responsibility as counselors is not to each other and therefore any punishing actions that we take don't really reflect on TSAC Council itself. It reflects on our responsibility to the students. So when we decide not to do our work in this role where we're receiving a stipend, those who suffer are the people who elected us. So let's keep that in mind next year. Make sure no matter what, we're accountable. We have for the students, for the university, for the committees, for any work that we're trying to do in getting things done for this campus. Thank you. Thank you, Ree. We're going to go to Paul and Naomi. Uh, Naomi hasn't gone yet. Would you mind uh, reversing that order? That's okay. Right, Naomi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted a quick reminder. A lot of folks don't know this here. Um, today is also uh, Missing, Murdered, and Indigenous Women's Awareness Day. Um, that's why you may see a lot of Indigenous people wearing red today. I specifically forgot my shirt, so oh. excuse me. Um, but um, yeah, so just kind of be mindful about who you're wishing Cinco de Mayo for, because that's also not politically correct. That is definitely an American thing. Um, but today is not a day for celebration for a lot of other individuals. Today is a, a day for remembrance and mourning. So just kind of be conscious about who you come encounter with today. Um, I just wanted to kind of put that note out there for folks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Sorry for reversing the order. Here. Um, I appreciate you recognizing me for a second time, and I'll keep it short. But I really wanted to respond to a little bit of what Dan had said. And I wanted to say to everyone listening in the public and whoever's watching this recording into the future, um, you know, the truth is much stronger than any potential lie or any potential mischaracterization. And I would encourage everybody to consider the facts, um, look at the recordings of what's happened in these meetings over the last year, look at what's been written, look at the work uh, that's being done. Don't listen to any one person's characterization of what's happened and take that as the truth. And we must be critical thinkers when we, uh, when we hear this kind of talk. Talk is very easy. Talk is cheap, um, but you need to take a look at who's doing the work. And uh, I stand proudly behind the work I've done on this campus in every bit of advocacy that I've done. And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of having a political perspective and a political ideology. And I won't be scared by people just invoking the names there. Um, there's people all across the world that hold those views. And so I stand amongst them. Um, and so no McCarthyist attacks like that are going to are going to cause me to back down or buckle here, Dan. And I would ask that you, hey, you please cut it out like the third time. Um, I think you're better than that. Uh, and I think you're better than a lot of this cheap talk. Man. Um, so that's everything I have to say. Great. Are there any other updates in our announcements? Amazing. On to advisor updates. Hi. Um... OK, I have a few updates that I wrote down here. Um, the first and foremost, I just wanted to thank everyone who um, has shown some leadership in terms of helping with onboarding the new council. Um, I think that's going to be really important, and this is a critical time. So just really appreciate um, those of you who are taking the time to invest in them in that way. Um, and those of you who are continuing to please encourage you to coach, mentor, support, um, the new incoming group um, because they're they're going to need it. <laughs> um, so in addition to that, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, conversations I've been having with Armando and Taylor around the summer and thinking about um, how we are able to support you all to hopefully be um, a much more cohesive um, group next year. And um, we would like to offer um, in the summer a couple of community building sessions um, as you all mentioned so the stipends and the terms as of may this will be your last stipend there will not be a stipend for june and july so august will be when new stipends will be awarded um, and so we still thought it was really important to engage whoever has the opportunity to engage in the summer i know there are a lot of internships jobs other things going on and i want to respect and honor that um, and at the same time, or we want to, um, we do think it's critical and important for those who can engage if they want to do some type of team building, community building. So we will be reaching out after spring 
Um, so after May 12th, <laughs> to identify some dates and times that work for um, the new incoming members um, around um, doing that type of team and community building. I think that's one of the things that has been missing for a long time, not just this council for the past few years, especially since COVID. Um, and so we really want to try to structure that intentionally. Um, and then we're looking at offering a leadership retreat in August. And this year we're looking at two days, not one day. Um, so probably two days because we think there is a lot that needs to be covered. Um, and we are uh, looking at external facilitators to do that with you all um, who are continuing um, and with the new council. So just wanted to, to let you all know that we are in fact thinking and planning and working to, to figure out what that can look like. The other thing I wanted to um, also mention is um, we talked about the Native Indigenous um, Support Committee and um, they uh, did work with Desiree to get her the information that was needed around the incentives. Um, thank you to Paul. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, we have uh, so far as of, I just checked before this meeting, we have 66 um, folks who have responded to the survey, which is pretty good. I'm really, um, I don't know what percentage that is, but it will close tonight. Um, and so if you all know of students, please encourage them to complete it if, if they have not done so already. Um, and then the other survey is the faculty workload survey that I sent out a few weeks ago to both, or was it last week? I don't know. Um, sometime recently, I think it was in the last week, um, that uh, Dr. Parmalee asked me to send out to get feedback from you all on the faculty workload issue and what is important to you all as students and student leaders. If you have um, have the time to fill that out or if you can please send it to your um, to students who you think might be interested in providing that feedback, it is important to have that input um, in the conversation as we are talking about the faculty workload issue. Um, yeah. And I think that's it. I just want to thank everyone for an awesome inauguration last week, too. It was really great. So thank you, everyone, for showing up for one another and for just creating such a positive vibe um, for the new group. Appreciate you all. Thank you, Dr. Barone. Armando, do you have any other updates? Um, I just want to reiterate, thank you again for inauguration. It was a really well event. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, the food for finals. Yes, that was the biggest thing. The food did come in the produce. <clears throat> so if you go to the TSAC office, you will see a bunch of fruits and juices and stuff. Um, I had told Mike and Kenny if they could put a note on it. Please, please, please refrain from having one use it. Um, if students are indeed hungry or need something, please direct them down to their Roadrunners food pantry. Um, but just because that's counted stuff for food for finals so we want to make sure we have enough to serve those days um other than that that's really it for right now um the elections team and the elections managers terms have ended already so they are no longer technically parts of tsec um they have fulfilled their duties and moved forward so yeah I think that is really all they're recovering. Um, Dr. Barone and I did catch glimpses of the conversation that was in the chats about elections. Um, we just wanted to let you know that is larger issues than you all as election, elections and TSEC are two separate entities. So um, we are going into, we're not going into, we're discussing with the legal team what that really looks like because the changes a lot of you are proposing are referendums that will shake the whole building and shake the whole structure that technically cannot be done as of this moment anymore. So there will be uh, recommendations and or things shall y'all choose for the next year. But like I said, we are talking to legal to see what you can and cannot do uh, moving forward, and we will advise you as we are advised moving forward. Thank you, Armando. Naomi has a quick question, and then we're going to go into public comment. Um, yeah, Dr. Barone, is that does that survey have a QR code that's linked to registering them directly, or is it possible to get it um, registered? Like when they take it from the uh, from the QR code, can they be directly registered into winning one of the incentives? No. 
based um, on their, when they sign in, it's attached to, to their 900 number. Um, so it cannot be, it can't, it doesn't work like a QR code can. It's just different. So um, no, that's not possible in this, with the way that we're doing it because of the system that we're using. Okay. Um, but they do get to opt in for the incentives as part of the survey. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. We are now going to go what, into public. Oh, chat, one one last thing. Um, you all did receive an email from me from OPA vote. It was not spam. Uh, please do uh, vote in that system. Uh, we were testing out a new election system to see if we could save us some money next year in our elections instead of paying through Rotary oh. link and all that kind of stuff. So if you see that link, can you please just uh, do it? It's a fake election, so do as your heart please, but it's a quick three seconds. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We're now going to go into public comment. So if you're here from the public, please make yourself known. Hi, my name is Antoine, but I go by X. Part of the reason why I'm here today regarding public comment is just to address the Student Advocacy Council and the circumstance with regards to student involvement um, requiring being the requirement of a year um, as some of the folk who are on this council specifically you taylor um, as you know we allowed individuals who might not have been on the ticket to become a part of the council um, and so we extended concessions opportunities so that all of our students can participate in the Student Advocacy Council. To my knowledge from conversations with Re, as well as Naomi, the changes around those requirements took place um, by the Judicial Committee, specifically James Vargas, in terms of the Constitution creation and that ratification process happening internally without the inclusion of our students. To me, that is an oversight. If your advocacy is just emphasizing your own possibilities instead of making sure that there are limitless possibilities for all of our students, that's a problem. And furthermore, the acknowledgement around the verification process on behalf of Tristan Smith, an outstanding student here at MSU Denver and still not receiving feedback from this administration, Dr. Cynthia Barone, Armando, as well as some of the other administration regarding the circumstance to me is troubling. And it's also a reclamation of existing election circumstances dating back to writing candidates and the information around that and the caveats in the discongruencies within the administration on them doing their jobs. So I'm here today just to ensure that this council and the representatives continue to maintain the support of the origins of its existence, which is advocating for all students, regardless if you like each other or not, you have to find a way to advocate for the 17 plus thousand students that you have the honor and the privilege to represent and are being paid out of their student fees for. I also want to conclude that the narratives that have been suggested from this administration about what has been inherited by the previous TSAC is just a regulation of the circumstance of acknowledging that this administration too has had its problems and this administration too has had its problems on reaching the student population. And so no more excuses. I'm not going to continue to sit back and observe this council make a spectacle of our student population and take away opportunities for people to be seated here, just like you. If your advocacy is not tied to other individuals in their lived experience, then all you're doing is self-serving, self-seeking, and lining your pockets. And to me, that's problematic. And if that is the circumstance of members in this council, then you don't need to be here. Thank you. Anybody else in person or online? Excellent. Um, 
Would we like to continue business or take a short break? What's the consent? We have time. Hmm? We have a lot on the agenda. A lot on the agenda. Excellent. Um, good point. Yep. So it, this is public comment time. So three to three fifteen uh, is time for the public to to speak to us. Should you so choose, um, we will cease our continuation of business. Should you come in during that time? Um, excellent. We will go to James uh, with Amendment Proposal 10. OK, sweet. Hi, everyone. So if you haven't read this already, basically what this does is amends the Constitution to ensure that the students that we uh, protect and serve, as always, are people with uh, certain disabilities, not certain disabilities, but with disabilities in general. Uh, many will recognize this is a modified version of the amendment that uh, Alex and uh, Paul brought forward a couple of weeks ago. I have just simply modified it. The biggest difference is, is I know we had an issue with the word political opinion in there. Um, so basically what I've done with this is to ensure that we have an actual process when it comes to political opinion. Uh, so what this means is we will keep the word political opinion in there, but we also recognize that sometimes people do abuse their freedom of speech. But as we have learned throughout this entire year that ESAC itself cannot do anything in regards to the First Amendment. So we will simply just go to the advisors and uh, the deans when we have any types of uh, issues like this. So we're still keeping the word, but we are ensuring that this council has at least some safeguards that they can use without infringing on anyone's First Amendment speech. All right, we'll go into discussion starting with opposition. Or just discussion in general. Go ahead, Paul. I want to offer my critical support of this resolution. I think in large part uh, it's it's good that we're adding the disability portion. I, I continue to think that um, re reviewing free speech is too generally or mechanically. I, I don't think it's a violation of free speech when a workplace fires somebody who sexually harasses a coworker using their speech. I don't think that's a Part of free speech, I think if you were to hurl a racial epithet at a customer, I think that would merit your removal from a workplace. And I see this um, as a place where we do work. You know, this, we get we get a stipend. Uh, this isn't a job, right? We talk about that for specific tax purposes and stuff. But at the end of the day, I think that um, behavior, lack of um, advocacy, um, flagrant disregard for any sort of respect for our campus community or our uh, colleagues here. Um, I think all of that is actionable uh, without necessarily infringing on someone's free speech. It's not an infringement of free speech when a workplace fires somebody for, for that kind of behavior. Um, and they don't think of it that way. And I'm sure there's Supreme Court precedent that would that would back that up. I, I'm just not a, uh, I'm not a law student, so I, won't, I don't have it on hand. I just wanted to speak to that, although this does have my support. I, I do. I do think we're continuing to view this question a little mechanically, but uh, thank you for putting this up together, James. I, I think in large part it accomplishes more good than it has any sort of harm. So you have my support. Is there any other discussion? OK, then I would like to call the question. I can that. I can it. Wonderful. We're going to go into voting now. Um, Dan. Yes. Alex? Aye. James? Aye. Naomi? Aye. Ree? Aye. Taylor? Aye. Chad? Aye. Mike? Yes. Alan? Yes. Paul? Yes. Gabe? Yes. Stephanie? Yes. Wonderful. It has passed unanimously. On to the next order of business, which is the resolution to upgrade TSAC door. James and Paul. OK, so another little thing that we have developed. So as many of you know, our door is not accessible to students with disabilities. Um, and I have also really realized that too with my given foot situation. So. Uh, Armando gave us the quote to how much this would cost. And so basically what we are asking is that we give uh, or pay the amount of $5,158 or $5,158 to a hex. So that way we can upgrade our door to be more accessible to students with disabilities. And this will allow them to have better access to us 
and come to us with any help that they need. All right, we'll open up to discussion. Mike. But hello, James. So um, I've read re resolution. Can you explain to me why the store is costing us five grand? Uh, you can check the quote that Armando gave us. It has all the uh, details as to why um, they got to pay for new parts and they have to obviously do labor. And then there's another thing I think Dr. Barone is going to help me with that. So I can respond. So this um, so. Several of the doors in the Tivoli have been outdated for a long time, and we have within um, my area have been updating and they are five thousand um, dollars. We just had the Veterans Center, I think, right after COVID um, was updated. It was around that and the LGBTQ Center is also being updated. It's the same price. So this is a standard cost analysis and it's 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 that expensive. I think there is some concern, let me just address this too, around why is why are individual departments paying for this when this should be a hex responsibility? I know, especially when it comes to compliance and ADA. And um, we have not been able to make any traction on that argument, especially when we are tenants of the Tivoli. Um, and so that is really unfortunate, but it is the reality that we're living in right now. And my sense has been that it's more important to be accessible than to right have that because they don't have the funding and so they're not going to pay for it. And so individual departments and areas have had to pay for things like doors, things like security systems, a lot of other things because AHEC has not been maintaining the Tivoli um, in the way that you would think a landlord would. But I'm just going to let that go. <laughs> and um, if you all, but students might have some stronger um, pull in that conversation. And maybe that's a conversation to take up for State Camp. Wonderful. On to Paul, then Taylor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Barone, for your input. And I uh, share a great deal of unity with your perspective on it, I believe. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll spare us all the uh, a rant about that, but I wanted to say that this price point um, is actually, I think, very low when we consider what it is we're accomplishing here. We're opening the doors of our student government to all students at MSU. This includes students who need this kind of access to a door. And it's not just students who might be visiting our office, but it's students who would want to use it, who would want to be members of student government. Um, and I, I think when we talk about opening doors and, and getting rid of barriers, um, yeah, this price point's pretty low when it comes to eradicating a major barrier. Um, it's honestly, an, I, I got a wheelchair bound friend, a wheelchair user friend, I should say, um, that comes to the student government um, every once in a while. And it's, a kind, of, it's kind of embarrassing, honestly. Uh, you know, a lot of wheelchair users don't like, um, they want to be independent, you know? They don't like it when um, people go around holding doors for them because they can open a door, but it is really honestly a struggle to open our door and then navigate your way into this. And I'm not just doing this for my friend, but rather for any student at MSU, uh, like like James, you know, finds themselves in a uh, in a predicament where it's um, hard to get doors open and crutch your way through. Um, this presents a really, really big barrier, uh, an instance of, of physical and structural discrimination. Um, and that's how the ADA was born, was the recognition that the lack of curb cuts, uh, the lack of uh, ramps and uh, elevators were in fact structural and architectural discrimination against these individuals. And I think that, you know, that conversation is not over with and we have a role to play in it. Um, and yeah, so I, I uh, strongly uh, urge all members to vote yes on this resolution so we can do what should have been done a long time ago and what what uh, AHEC should be doing, but uh, we'll, you know, if they're not willing to do it, we'll pick it up and do it ourselves and, and, and prove that students can do things. So uh, that's all. Thank you, Paul. We're going to go to Alex, Taylor, then Mike. Uh, so I just had a follow up question for Dr. Barone. Um, when we do get these receipts uh, for the doors and with the various departments, is that something we can potentially bring to a case against AHEC in the future to show that they aren't being 
like ADA compliant, if this does gain traction later on, this, this could be something that we, that we should present to whatever legal team or whatever, uh, sure. to say that they aren't fulfilling their obligations. Yeah. I mean, you're totally welcome to do that. I do think, yeah, it would probably be worth a conversation with our um, legal counsel too, just to get their input and insight, but it is a a conversation that's being raised in a lot of spaces. And at the end of the day, day, most folks are just saying, we just need to do it because we don't, we want to reduce barriers for and create ex- accessible spaces, but it's come up in a lot of spaces with a lot of um, students and staff. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. On to Taylor, then Mike. So I am wondering um, to the authors of this resolution, CMEI, they just recently updated their door. And an ob- some observations from that are that the door is really heavy. And to get it to open, you basically need to ring a doorbell and someone comes and opens it for you. And I'm wondering, um, how is that more accessible? And is this the same type of situation that would happen in our office? Uh, from what I've been told, at least, that the door would be similar to like a handicap door that you use. You push a button and it open for you. Uh, those doors are heavier because of the machinery that's in them. Uh, but the hope is, is that once the all the stuff's implemented, the door just opens for people. Um, the only other issue I can see in the you know, foreseeable future is the button getting worn out. And that's probably something that future counselors or SGAs or whatever exists at the time need to uh, fix. Uh, but yeah, that's like the whole idea is to allow it to soon to push a button and opens for them instead of having to fight the door when coming in. Thank you. Armando, did you have a response to that too? Yeah, I can respond to the CMEI portion of it. It's not so much of the the door was repaired or anything. The door is now locked and someone comes to open the door because of security issues. As you've all seen, the media thefts and the different things and different people that have been in the Tivoli that cause concern. That's why the door is locked and now requires someone to open it. So this is nothing that you all have to implement, shall you choose, but it's definitely something that I would consider from 8 to 5 p.m. Individuals should be there to monitor it if the door is going to stay closed because there is an option to leave the door open, like unlocked, so people can get in and out easier. Okay, thank you. On the mic. Hello, James. Um, I do support. I do support this, but I do think this raises some issues, uh, some some broader issues, um, as well. Um, to that point, I mean, I still need to. I'm still picturing how that machine at the top of the door. Because I don't think they didn't replace the door with cement. They just put a machine on the top of it that opens it. Um, I don't know how it costs five grand, but um, furthermore, I think this kind of exposes some issues. I never heard of a tenant having to pay their landlord to fix, like to upgrade this. I mean, it's just kind of ridiculous in my opinion. Um, I don't understand that. James? Uh, so yeah, I kind of agree that like this definitely should be something that AHEC should do themselves. However, it doesn't seem like they're going to get really on to it. And by the time it takes us to even convince them to do it, it might be 10 years from now. So I think as a student government, it is our job to unfortunately carry their slack and help the students immediately. Um, so I think that this is definitely we should, you know, we can take just kind of like what we did with the food pantry years ago. You know, no one was going to help us with that. We had to do it ourselves. And that, you know, looks better on the TSAC than it does a heck. Thank you. Um, on the palm. I just wanted to express that I'm uh, grateful that this conversation has brought up some uh, issues for the next council to pick up, um, specifically around ADA and specifically around how we as like tenants at AHEC, I'm speaking for MSU here, we as tenants at AHEC um, are getting kind of a raw deal. Um, you know, we're told they don't have the money. Well, they make an awful lot of money off of parking, among other things. Um, and in all honesty, I, I'm just, um, I think the fact that it's uncovered uh, a lot of these items to discuss in the future. Mike, I, I look forward to working with you and advancing these issues in SACAB. Um, you know, conversations around ADA need to be happening, and I'm, and I'm glad they are. So thank you, Council, for uh, uniting around a discussion on accessibility and uh, questions of our you know, rights as tenants on, on our campus. Wonderful. Is there any other discussion on this? Then I would like to call the question.
Second. All right, let's get to it. Um, Dan. <clears throat> Alex. No. Uh, I. Did I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, James. I. Naomi. Mm, that's Stain. Bree. I. Taylor. I. Chad. I. Mike. Yes. Alan. I. Um. Yeah. Paul. Proud to vote yes. Gabe. Yeah. And Stephanie. Yes. The motion passes. Congratulations. On to new business. Vote on accountability process. Oh, we took that one off. My bad. On to discuss handbook update. James. Uh, so this is actually just a quick little question if anyone's had any feedback on the handbook. As you know, I've been rewriting it. Or not really rewriting, more of updating it, I guess, to fit with our current governing structure as well as uh, disempowering it because I do believe that having both the Constitution and the handbook creates a lot of conflicts between the two. Uh, so the idea is, is that the handbook would mostly just become a uh, guide for rules and decorum that we have because there's a lot of things I still agree with on how we should present ourselves and how we should present ourselves in the office and handle all that. Uh, so it's it's not really a constitutional or not a, constitutional, a governing power anymore. It would just be like we would go to it for reference. It does have some power, but only when it comes to rules and decorum uh, within the council itself, not governing structure. Uh, so I just really wanted to get any quick updates on if anyone has anything. If not, then we can move on. But just to see, because I do plan on trying to get this either voted in probably next week, hopefully. Go ahead, Paul. Oh, Reed, did you have? All right, Paul, go ahead. I just wanted to speak in support of the document that's been uh, proposed by James. I think um, it's 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 been made more succinct in some ways. Um, and I think the idea of it being like a general guide instead of us having kind of two, two bylaws that um, can, can be in contradiction is, is a, generally a good model for us to, to pick up. Um, and if and you know if there if, if it produces a need to revise our our constitution to make up for any part that the handbook itself covered but the constitution didn't, we should make the changes necessary there. Um, but I think this is a good document. I would encourage folks to read it. Um, it's really solid. Bree, did you have a comment? I just was going to say something similar, using it as a reference tool and you know information with a lot of the background of this organization. I think it's helpful. Taylor. Well, I appreciate the um, the work and the sentiments going into the handbook. I want to raise the concern that we are making rules for the incoming council that we are not really going to have to follow. So it's making rules for thee, but not for me in a sense, because I feel like they should be the ones to implement these changes if they so choose. Uh, you know, I, I kind of feel the same sentiment. However, I mean, mostly what I've done is with this is just update anything that we've already passed as a council. There's nothing necessarily new in here other than taking away its power, because again, I think it creates conflicts between the two documents and that creates issues for the council trying to determine well, what do we listen to first, the Constitution or the handbook? As you all know, I have been the constitutional junkie, and so I always say the Constitution, but everyone's interpretation will be different than mine. So I think it's just easier for the incoming council to have one governing document, and then the handbook can be used as what most handbooks are for people is just rules and decorum. Awesome. I'm going to take the floor real quick, and then we'll go to Mike, then Paul. Um, one. OK, got it. Um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought now. Uh, just one thing. Are we planning on making this like a living document that we can put links in? Because I'm just looking under like use of seals and logos. I know that um, MSU has their own total branding kit that is a lot more robust than what's here that we could just direct people to as far as a, um, like a, yeah. So then we don't have to rewrite everything that's being used. Yeah, so the way I kind of saw it is if the future councils want to update it, they definitely can. I didn't put any like severe, like, you need a unanimous vote to change it. Like, it can be voted on like a simple majority. 
However, I do realize there are a lot of other documents that would probably help out as well, and that's why we're disempowering it so that it doesn't have that conflict anymore. So if there is something that MSU Denver says that we can do with seals and logos, then we can utilize that. The handbook wouldn't basically be pulling us back from that. Great. Thank you. We're going to go to Naomi, Mike, Ben Palm. So I'm kind of confused because uh, if, if I'm right, you just said that this is going to be something of more like to kind of like direct us in how we need to hold slash represent ourselves in this space, right? Okay, so then why did we have Robert's rules? Was that, because I thought that was what we used to represent or hold ourselves or to represent ourselves here in this space. So is that just like, are these both just kind of like suggestions then? Like what's the point of just having a suggestion? So Robert's rules will mostly still conf uh, lead our meetings is pretty much what that one's for. Um, so whenever we're in the meeting space, the Robert's rules is what we use. Uh, pretty much what this is, is like just how we hold ourselves as counselors, both inside and outside of the office. Um, so obviously, if you're out doing advocacy work and you're advocating on behalf of the students, um, you know, some of the requirements for like, hey, just be courteous to the students, do this. Like that's pretty much what it entails. But when it comes to meetings, uh, Robert's rules will always be what guides us unless change in the future. Uh, but pretty much what, why we have that is just so that like, you know, when people come in, they're like, okay, you know, I need, I need to learn some of these things, how I talk in the office, how I even work in the office, just basic stuff. Uh, but yes, in, in meetings, it will always be Robert's rules of ours until changed. Cool, thank you. On to Mike, then Paul. <clears throat> So um, I agree with some of the sentiments that Taylor is saying. Um, I don't think, I think, first of all, the Constitution is a law of the land. That's the, what document we should follow. So I do agree that the handbook should kind of just be like a like a guiding document throughout the year. Now, I do think um, we could, this is something the new council can take up at a retreat. Hey, these are the rules you want to set in place um, for various different things. And that could be like maybe the first thing that they approve the new, in the new term, which um, our new meetings will start in August. So um, I don't. As we are in the last month of our term, I don't think it's our. I don't think it should be our kind of um, place to um, establish rules. That, I mean, we're not going to follow for next for the next council. Wonderful, Anna Paul. I want to offer some light disagreement with that idea and with um, with the idea that we're making rules for the not for me sort of thing. I think that as student advocates, if we take um, if we take our role seriously insofar as we advocate for the student body, right, and, um, you know, we make our decisions in, in, in a way that benefits the student body, I think one thing that'll benefit the student body is a lasting student government structure. Like the idea that we would essentially be like melting it down every year to start anew would kind of put us on the kind of like rocky footing that um, last year's council found themselves on, that we found ourselves on, and are only only beginning to find ourselves the way out of. Um, you know, we do have the ability to create frameworks and ultimately rules that can help uplift our work um, and organize it in a way that uh, helps us achieve our goals of advocating for students. Um, and none of that is necessarily like dominating the new people coming in in any unjust way. Um, if anything, it's, it's, it's helping them. It's laying a strong foundation. And um, if you look at colleges that have had long lasting student governments, they're able to do they're able to do some really good things. They're very they're they're very in touch with their university administration, their student population, their bylaws are rock solid. I think of George Washington University is a good example um, that uh, you know Roy has talked to me about and I know James and I have talked about and there there are just um, there's something about being able to set a precedent and um, you know, we're not just advocating for ourselves when we create these rules or creating rules just for ourselves. It's a kind of uh, like a very individualistic, hyper individualistic way of viewing our roles here or the creation of bylaws. When if we're if we're working together as a group and as members of a school and, and understanding that we're um, the, the MSU student government is going to be a lasting um, part of this institution, then we can we can take on that kind of framework and and. and uh, and work within it as a part of it rather than like, you know, everybody being isolated chapters or something like that. Thank you, Paul. Um, we are going to Naomi, then James. So I, I think I'm really kind of agreeing with you guys on this side where it comes to that, like we need to kind of let the next council members collectively decide, but also this needs to be something that we 
like approach with students as well, because how we're viewed in the student body and like, okay, for instance, like what you consider respect, what I consider respect are two different things. What you consider angry and disruptive, I may not consider angry and disruptive. So I feel like this is something that these guidelines need to be involvement of the students. How do they think that we should handle ourselves? How do they think that we should be representing them? Because that's who we're representing, right? Like, so we can't just sit here and say that, you know, what we say is law and valid because it's technically not like that's kind of taking on that tyrant behavior. And I don't think that's fair to our students. I think that we need to at least ask them what they think, um, you know, how they want us to interact with them, how we should be appearing to them, especially in spaces where we're supposed to be representing them, like at um, president's cabinets meetings or um, board of trustees meeting, things like that. Um, so maybe I think that before we take on anything else, we should talk to the students first. And whether that be a survey or just tabling a little bit more a few weeks and then putting into the handbook, I think that would be great. It's not that I dismiss this handbook, but I think I dismiss the idea of putting more into it without the input of students as well. Thank you, Naomi. On to James. So I can actually speak to two of those things. Uh, first off, mostly what's in this handbook is already in the handbook. A lot of what has been changed are things that we neither practice or conflict with the Constitution. There's very little in here that's actually new. It's mostly just deleted stuff because there's things in here that we never did or never practiced or the Constitution was like, no, we don't do this. Uh, I would agree to bring students in. You know, I'd love to hear from them as well. Uh, but the other thing is, is the reason why I've taken up this and as well as making the Constitution is because one thing that I've heard from students, why they don't want to give us more funding is because we had no accountability structure. There was nothing that was structuring us, and which is why I created the Constitution which is why I wanted to do this back in March. But um, so I did that because students were just like, I don't see the point in giving them more money or even my support when, you know, they can't even keep themselves accountable. They're getting paid with my student fees. Why should I care about them? You know, because like, some students really still don't see our impact. You know, I, I think most of our events still only get roughly 100 to 300 students. Um, and we still have over 18,000 students that we need to serve. Uh, so I will definitely agree to like getting students feedback on this, but I am just saying like nothing in here is new. It's mostly just updated to fit of how we work, what's in the constitution or get rid of stuff we never even practice. Uh, one other thing I will point out is the removal procedures is highlighted right now because I plan on, as you all know, I'm working on a different accountability structure because we've had such an issue with that this year with the deans. And so once that is fulfilled, then I will delete that portion from the handbook. So that's just another update, but I totally agree with you. Um, I would love to get the students feedback on this as well, but this is pretty much why I've been doing uh, working on this. Um, point of clarification. So just to be clear, when this handbook was written, distributed, um, I don't know who that was by, but students' perspective were not taken into account when creating this initially, right? Or not that you know of. I don't know. I, I unfortunately was not there to write the handbook, so I don't know if the students got any real say. Uh, Taylor might know. I don't know. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I know you were here last year, so I don't know if you would know. Thank you. I have the floor right now. Thank you. Um, this this handbook is, as far as I understand right now, is very contradictory to the Constitution, and it is technically a governing document. Is that correct? Correct. And so with the passage of this new member handbook that is just a more streamlined version of the handbook, it would then just be a recommendation to the council. It's not a governing document of any kind. Is that also what you're suggesting? Yeah, I will hold no or no governing power. It's just simply for, you know, I need to review something. I need to make sure that I'm doing something right, but it's not, it doesn't hold any constitutional power or anything. Right. Okay. And that's And that's what I think that we're getting at. And I think we might be confused as far as the Rules for rules for thee, not for me. It's it's quite literally as far as I'm seeing it is just a, a easier way for us to. To pass on new information to the council, future council. That's all that I have. Now I think it's Dan. Dan, switch your mics. As I don't believe that th this was just a discussion. Yeah. This wasn't uh, they, us we're not voting on this. No, thank you, Dan. No, this is mostly for me to get feedback on it. Um, I'm still I'm oh, planning on bringing it up next Good. week. So if you have any other feedback, definitely okay. email me or shoot me a text. Uh, but yes, we're not voting on this today because I still want to get everyone's feedback. Okay, still up. I need to edit. Uh, okay, but sure. no, thank you. I appreciate no, that. Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we're on to the next item. Okay. I mean, I motion we close discussion on this. Second. Second. Great. Is anyone opposed? So moved. On to the next order of business, which is the resolution to change elections protocols for greater transparency and understanding. Re and Naomi. Awesome. So I would like to give a huge shout out to uh, Tristan and X for bringing this stuff to our attention and allowing us to help in the advocacy work. Um, I'd like to thank Alex for endorsing this and Re for doing much of the handiwork here. Um, the hard work, sorry. Um, and yeah, so we did um, make an adjustment to this prior to it being put in. I took out that adjustment due to the um, legalities that are behind changing the way elections are processed and worked and things like that. So we are going to further investigate that. Um, so I have stri uh, striked that from the um, solutions that we are asking for. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and read this. Um, thank you. So uh, resolution to change election protocols to seek greater transparency and understanding uh, written by Re, myself, and also collaborated with Tristan and X and, and endorsed by Alex. So section one, the abstract, this past February, council voted to pass a resolution entitled Schedule and Fund the Polls Act. Starting the elections are crucial to the continued success of student government. The Student Advocacy Council, SGTSAC, the intent of that resolution was to enable the elections team to work with council members to create events surrounding elections and create a new elections code and elections manual. However, there are several items that were part of the recent elections manual and process that we feel must be revised in writing and in practice in order to be fair to all students running for council. There was at least one candidate, Tristan Smith, who was unable to run for office due to eligibility rules that were unclear in the election packet, which we feel needs to be clarified. This candidate was I'm um, sorry, this candidate also mistakenly chose a category category for candidacy and would have benefited from have been, having been asked if that choice was correct, considering he failed to also check the counselor box for candidacy in a way that all other candidates for trustee and say cap positions had done. If he had been questioned when the packet was returned to the elections team, that would have been immediately corrected. These are items we feel can be changed and will benefit students in future elections. Tristan Smith has affirmed he checked the wrong box for election, but we feel accountability not for not having been asked for confirmation of his chosen position, as well as for lack of transparency regarding the verification process is due from the elections committee slash advisors. It is our belief that anyone checking his packet would have seen there was a mistake in his not having checked the box for counselor. He also confirmed to us that he had asked when his election packet was thoroughly read and by whom it was confirmed and in his opinion, has not received an adequate reply. In presenting this resolution, Naomi Hawkins and Reeve Arco are advocating for Tristan Smith as well as future student candidates who wish to run for council. It is our hope that our fellow counselors can discuss these proposed changes and vote to amend our processes for sharing information with and receiving election packets from students in future elections. Our goals. The goals of this resolution are to one, rewrite the elections packet so it clearly states eligibility rules, including the defined length of a term of service and provides a space for each candidate to handwrite which positions, the, a position or positions they are seeking for additional clarity. Two, include a time frame slash date period for returning election packets so at least one of the election team members or advisors is present and available for questions. During this period for returning election materials, the election team member advisor will also, I'm sorry, will ask each pers pers yeah, prospective candidate to confirm the position they are seeking, avoiding any confusion if boxes were checked incorrectly. And four, each packet should be time date stamped and the prospective candidate should be given a time frame they can expect to receive a reply after having their packet checked by TSAC advisors, faculty reference, active student registration, so on and so on. Whereas SGT SAC is made up of a board of student leaders who are committed to the advancement and advocacy of students. The counselor description specifically states council members utilize all means necessary for the incorporation of students into the university experience and are governing and the governing and are the governing body that share responsibility with the administration to bring about changes. Be it resolved that SGT SAC elections materials should clearly state all requirements for student candidacy and prospective candidates are immediately informed about their eligibility and election packet confirmed for accuracy by election managers or advisors. Be it further resolved. 
We also ask the council membership to approve these four goals and agree that they will become part of the next election process to prospective candidates may experience a transparent election process with council requirements clearly delineated and applications checked for accuracy. I would just like to say as a comment that I think the problem that happened here is yes, I can understand from both perspectives like, yes, of course, the student's an adult, they should be able to double check. And on the other hand, well, the counselors should also double check the packets and follow up with the students, right? On both of these ends, I feel like we are forget to re forgetting to realize we are human beings before we are anything. And there is a lack of compassion and a lack of understanding that I feel like we could have really avoided this whole fiasco if we would have just checked in with the student and just had some compassion for one another and maybe even just reverse the fact of that he didn't even get to be a, get a chance to be a counselor. We didn't check in to see if we can do anything on the metadata side. Like when I've definitely given a lot of different, I'm sorry, a lot, I've given a resource who predominantly has worked with coding websites and metadata that probably could have fixed this problem in a matter of 24 hours without any kind of complaints. And I just think that we need to consider that when we're thinking about passing this resolution is that this is something that's trying to help us have compassion and understanding from each other as human beings rather from he said, she said perspective. So this is a way to create that environment and safe space for our students to equally participate in elections in the future. Um, and that is all. And I would like to read a statement from Tristan and I would appreciate if Dr. Baron or, um, oh my gosh, I can't even talk. Armando would like to reply to the second part of this statement. I know that Tristan wanted to speak um, during the public comment, but was unable to. But in regard to this resolution, if I can add for him, I'm not looking for an apology. I want accountability for me that's recognizing the issues and the confirmation and verification processes that exist and impacted my campaign, but have the potential to impact so many others. Anyone can say, I'm sorry. They need to acknowledge the issues exist, that they led to errors, and in this instance, that they are going to make changes to those processes moving forward to prevent this from happening again. I will also continue to fight against the full year requirement for counselors. It would be simple to bring on two to four reserve counselors through the elections process who are also part of the training process over the summer and who are paid like the rest of the counselors while attending meetings and working with the council to stay up to date on everything that's going on. The money is there to pay them and it would go a long way to address exclusionary practices in the student government. And so I invite, I know that explaining what we found earlier in the meeting, what we were told about changing the terms, it would benefit Tristan and any other listeners to know this, if you could explain that either Dr. Barone or Armando, thank you. Um, also sure. after that, Tristan has another comment. Um, his teams um, wouldn't connect during public comment and wanted this to be put on as part of his collaboration for this. So after that, I would like to speak on account of him behalf of him. So I'll go ahead and respond to the terms question. Um, and I have reached out to various, not only internally, but externally around the terms. And as I've stated countless times over the past two years around the stipend model, making sure that we have a consistent term for all counselors is critical not only to being able to implement the stipend model, but to be able to sustain it. I've also shared that in terms of the amount of the stipends, because that conversation has been brought up um, actually just a few weeks ago, I think, around paying different amounts for different positions like SACAB and trustee again, and re-envisioning that. And I gave some recommendations to Mike, who we had a side conversation about that, but I just want to be really clear that a lot of times when the recommendations that it's not just around recommendations around how we're changing things, it's an entire structure and system that is in place now. And this the system is going on two years now of being in place and the stipend model was just implemented last year. And when we did that, there was a lot of work that went into that and we consistently reiterated that we needed to make sure that it was going to be sustainable and something we would be able to continue to do to be able to allow for um, students with different statuses to be able to participate in TSAC and creating that accessibility. 
And so that is really where a lot of the, that's one of the concerns. There are several others around the term um, that I, I don't want to go into right now, but that is the main one that I'm really concerned about when we think about um, the structure um, and how it will have implications for the stipends. The other thing is that um, I appreciate the advocacy, and if that is something that students really feel is needed, I would encourage you all to do your due diligence and your research to look at other other institutions and how that might be working, and then bring that back and get student input and student vote um, next year to be able to think about what that could look like for those of you who are continuing and really want to take this on, um, because it's, I don't think, something that clearly in the last month of your term that is going to be able to, to be implemented. And so the other thing I want to say is keeping elections and TSAC separate is really important because of the conflict of interest, right? And TSAC governing what our elections team is doing or um, having a heavy hand in that, I think is problematic and inappropriate um, because of the conflict of interest there. Um, so just something, I appreciate the recommendations. We absolutely want to meet with Tristan. We were supposed to meet with him on Wednesday. He wasn't able to do that. Um, and we are looking forward to meeting with him and having this conversation with him. Um, but I, and I am more than happy to apologize, apologize publicly that this happened. Um, and we will continue to work on that. But there are a lot of other systemic issues that I don't think you all are fully aware of that these, this has implications for. So anything else? Because I have to go to another meeting. No, this is, uh, i just speaking on behalf of Tristan now. Um, thank you, Dr. Ron. Uh, Tristan says, I was trying to get on for public, uh, the, de <laughs> the divisive nature of this council won't allow much to happen. Self-advocacy is a real problem. Exclusion is a real problem. Lack of transparency is a real problem. The constitution doesn't just affect TSAC members. It impacts the entire student body. There's a reason only 0.02% of the student body is voting. There is a giant disconnect. There are flaws in the processes and the students aren't being reached consistently. People are getting paid to do nothing and openly stating it in meetings with no accountability. Why would anyone back that or vote on that? How are governing documents written and passed without consent of the student body when it impacts them directly? Where does TSEC's power come from? Who is on the Judiciary Committee? How can there be success without accountability and transparency? There are too many things that need to be changed and addressed. The Constitution needs to allow all students to participate. Um, so I'm going to speak on this real quick for Tristan. Um, that is also why I personally am an advocate for the Judiciary Committee, because they are creating a system. And it is new, right? Like, we can't expect a system to be perfect its first year, first month, whatever, first semester. So I appreciate the fact that they are going to work to give it the structure that is right in order to hold all of us accountable for the things that we need to be held accountable for when it comes to doing advocacy work for the students. So I agree with Tristan 1000 percent. I just want to ex express that. But I do agree that we do need this Judiciary Committee because it is very important to be able to advocate for the students. And when we are not advocating for the students, for that to be recognized as well. So that way we are not holding people on a pedestal that they have no right being on. Um, and we shouldn't be on a pedestal regardless. We are nothing but peasants to these students. That's exactly what we are. We are here to serve them, and that is facts. Anyway. Okay, we're gonna open, up, open it up for discussion. We have Chad, Paul, and Taylor. All right, um, as far as the goals go for this resolution, as Dr. Barone was saying, we should not be muddying the waters between TSAC and elections. However, the elections code has says nothing about the elections packet. And I think that, yes, there could be more clarity in that. So I think that's the only thing that should stand as far as the goals go for this is the goal one to rewrite the elections packet. So it, it clearly states eligibility rules. Uh, everything outside of that, I, I think, is is just extra work that we're going to be putting on people who have already done a tremendous amount of work and will continue to do a tremendous amount of work. Um, especially, for example, like the checking back to ensure that somebody checked the correct box. There was a there was a student who ran in the election who only checked the SACAP box. They turned their paperwork in early enough that elections reached out to them and asked, is this what you want to do? And they had time 
to respond in the affirmative. And they continued with that course of action. Um, and then the idea of having auxiliary counselors, we can't even get all the counselors to show up to these meetings to begin with, let alone it was a suggestion that was brought up. Um, and that would also cut into the amount of stipend pay that everybody would be getting, which is already going to be lower next semester or next year. And this whole system, this whole verification or for example, the, the two the two semester requirement, it's all faith based to begin with. There's nothing that that is forcing any of us to stay here or not resign or drop out. And if you're not a student, then you are not you shouldn't be on the student government. That's that's all I have to say about all of that. Thank you, Chad. On to Paul, then Taylor. Thank you. Um, I want to unite with a lot of what's been said by Chad and our advisor, Dr. Barone. I think that we need to keep this type of model in mind when we consider any changes to uh, terms and stuff like that. I think the fact that we moved to the stipend model was a move for inclusion of students that previously weren't able to uh, enter the student government due to documentation status. And so I think it's a critical thing that we tread lightly on in terms of protecting that uh, move for inclusion. I also um, uh, am in opposition to this uh, specifically because of how it, um, it basically demands an apology out of our advisors and our elections team. And I know that as a council, we've moved towards a restorative justice approach. And I've been doing more reading on restorative justice and trying to understand what it is. I've been talking with um, the Restorative Justice Coalition to try and better my understanding of the subject. And from what I understand, part of restorative justice is getting together everybody involved in the harm, right? Um, and this would include those we're asking to apologize or would be demanding an apology from, and those who, um, uh, like Tristan and others, who were, were harmed by this, um, and having a conversation about what to do next. In, in my view, this is a, um, a subset of people. It's like we're making the same mistake we made before with uh, how Alan was asked to give a, um, an apology. He was demanded to give an apology but that wasn't something we had a conversation about as an entire council, Alan included. And so it was a misstep um, and a misapplication of restorative justice. It wasn't even really restorative justice at that point. And so um, I think this flies in the face of um, restorative justice as we try and like practice it on this council. I think that um, you know it, it in some ways threatens our integrity in terms of the stipend model. <clears throat> and uh, um, and yeah, you know, I, I do think that uh, there are ways that students who are here for half a year in our student government, we're not limited to inclusion in our student government by, by total membership here. Um, you know, there's co-authorships of resolutions or ways you can petition our student government. We can bring things to referendum, among other things, um, and we can work to build on ways that people can contribute. Um, and I want to say, uh, I want to not detract from the fact that uh, Tristan has raised a lot of very salient criticisms in this and in the messages that he's provided. Um, and I think we ought to um, take heart in them and learn from them um, and apply change moving forwards. So I, 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 uh, I thank you for submitting this, but I will be voting no. Thank you, Paul. On to Taylor, James and Naomi. Um, I want to say I do feel for Tristan and I do hope that the process can go better next year. Um, but I do want to point out that um, people have run for only board of trustee and SACAP before. I, one of my friends last year, Senna, she ran for both board of trustee and SACAP and she didn't get either. And then she obviously wasn't on the council this year, but that's, that's what she wanted. So in my opinion, it was not, that's not an uncommon thing to do. Um, and I want to also echo what has already been said about the conflict and interest of us um, rewriting a portion of the elections code. Thank you. On to James and Naomi. Um, so what I'll say is I know that Chad C and uh, my guy, I can't remember him, Jody, worked pretty hard on this elections code and our elections. And quite frankly, I think it went pretty well, given it was a whole new code for this year. Obviously, there's going to be issues. Nothing ever goes smoothly the first time, uh, but it's an issue that 
Chad has said he is addressing for next year already. Um, I just I don't see it as the big of an issue as that we are blowing out of proportion as it needs to be. Uh, I, I think for the first time for this code that it could have gone completely worse. I have reached out to Tristan. I've apologized that this happened and told him um, everything that I can. But I also need people to understand, like, you know, like Naomi said, we are human. We're going to make mistakes. Sometimes things are going to happen. And the best thing to do is just to communicate and work with each other as best we can. But at the end of the day, there's not much the council can do because we did ensure that we had very little say in the elections code or the elections team to ensure that, you know, me, Chad, or anyone would have any, you know, way of trying to like get us back into TSAC. Like it would be unfair to the students who are running. So I think it's best that we still try to address these issues, but without encroaching on the elections team. Um, I also knew that when I wrote into the constitution that a year requirement would be necessary, I knew that that would mean I couldn't run again. But at the same time, I agree with Chad that we want students on this. You know, when you're a student, you're in the classrooms, you're listening to all the students who are having issues about stuff because that's where most people have conversations. You have students who are going to different parts of this campus talking about their issues and like that's where you hear it. But when you're not a student, most people I know who aren't students hang out in the Tidley and the Tidley is full of students from three different campuses. So it's hard to tell like if an issue is from CCD or another school. And so I think like it's best that we, we keep students. This is not to say like if you're graduating, you can't, you know, have a part on this council because you still can. Being an elected member is definitely lets you have a voice, but it's not the only way to have a voice on this entire campus. You can come to public comment. You can reach out to the counselor and say this is an issue I'm having on campus. And it is our job to be that voice, to be that speaker. And so as much as I understand why we would want more people who are graduating, I also want to where the council doesn't have to worry about, OK, well, what if Chad's graduating in the fall and he decides you know, I'm done? I don't want to be on this campus anymore. He just leaves. I mean, now we got to figure out how to get someone else on. I don't agree with reserves because we don't have the funding for reserves. Um, so if, with that whole year requirement, I think it's necessary to stay, especially since I, as far as I've heard, SACAP and the board of trustees also require that as well. And then lastly, for the less than 1% that Tristan brings up for us, like how we're reaching out to our students, I want to make it aware like this has been an issue for years. This is not, you know, exclusive to this council. I mean, let's think about it. They changed from an SGA to TSAC with less than 1% of the students. So why is it suddenly like now it's an issue? Like this is an issue that I know Chad has been taking on, try to get more students to come in, realize we exist. So I don't think there's any blame to anyone in this council or even past councils, but it's an issue that has happened for a lot of this student government at MSU Denver. And we are trying to make it better. I don't think there's anyone that can be blamed. I don't think there's a document, whether it's the constitution, with the communal document or whatever, that is not at fault. It is just because, quite frankly, we're a commuter school. Not everyone cares to be here 24 7 listening to our student governments. People just want to go home right after class. We have to understand that people have lives outside of this and they don't care about student government sometimes. And that's not our fault. It's not their fault. It's just something that happens when you're not an exclusively on campus or on campus, yeah, type schooling. So that's all I'll say. Thank you, James. We have a motion in the chat to. Um call the question after the current stack, so, and it has been seconded. And so we will do that after Naomi and Mike speak. Okay, okay. we will vote after both of them speak. Okay, so I'm okay to go. Okay, um, Paul, I don't know if you're reading a different document, but we are no way, actually even in both documents, we are not asking for an apology. Tristan was not asking for an apology by any means. He was asking for accountability, which is, in my opinion, accountability is when you're following it up with actions in order to correct the wrongs that you've done. That's accountability. Um, there was no apology necessary. I understand that you said that you are hearing from that, and I respect that's how you perceive it, but that is not what is being asked here. Um, I think that it doesn't make sense to me because Tristan sees that we he just he understands what's happening and he knows that it can't be reversed. He's not asking for it to be reversed. He I think from his perspective, he's really just trying to be a part of making making sure this doesn't happen to future students in the in in the next elections. Um, what I don't understand, though, is that this is on the elections team's hands. Right. And I respect that this is their, their first year. Like 
um, you know, coming in and doing things differently, creating a new code. I respect that. Like nothing's going to be perfect. I even just now said that. So I'd be a hypocrite to disagree. Um, I do disagree that, I mean, we passed, a, like, what was it, a budget, right? It's in our budget to pay them. So I feel like we have every right to interfere with how they do things. So if we have, if they have, if we have input on how it needs to be ran, that students have brought to us, such as Tristan, then we need to have that input taken to them and then it needs to be implemented as well. And what doesn't make sense to me is if we already have a plan set up in place for if Chad just, you know, by example, decides to just not come back to school next semester, um, why does that stipend system work? But whenever we need to potentially tell students or what, how come that works, but we can't tell students that they can only be or they have to at least be here for a semester in order to proceed in running for TSAC. That doesn't make sense to me. We already have a system in place to back it up, get it covered, move forward. But all of a sudden, it's not OK if we want to put that in the elections packet. So I understand, though, the behind the scenes of why we need to be able to protect students who are not involved in. What if a clarification? There is too much speaking going on when I only speaking. Can we please allow her time? I need everyone. I don't care. I need everyone to please allow Naomi her time. This is her time, not anyone else's. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just I don't understand that part of it. And maybe that's something I know Cynthia left, but she'll need to respond to that. Um, so I just yeah, there's just a lot of stuff that goes around the elections. And I feel like students a have not been involved enough. There hasn't been enough B, there hasn't been enough transparency and see we haven't even been using our own voices as counselors within the elections process to help the students get the advantages that they need to participate in this. Um, and I understand, like you were saying, um, James, that like they are students, they they I know my first semester. I didn't care. I didn't care what any of this institution had to offer. Like if it didn't get me money, I don't care. But coming to see how different students struggle and realizing that they're not going to take the time to stand up for themselves. That's where the advocacy work comes in, right? That's what brought my passion onto this is like, well, if you're not going to advocate for yourself, I'm going to advocate for you because I hear about your problems and that's not okay that you're going through this in an institution that has the tools to serve you. Um, I think that's it. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi on the mic. Hello. Um, so I agree with what's been said by the majority of the council currently. Um, something that kind of struck out when Naomi said is um, though we did pay for our elections, they, we should absolutely have no interference in the elections process. That should be, that's an absolute conflict of interest. That's corruption. Um, that is something I think should be absolutely separate. And um, to that point, um, elections are over this year. I, I like to remind the council that last year elections almost didn't happen. Like we were elected in, in a special election. So um, I give some grace to, I mean, I give some grace to our elections managers for having to rewrite an entire new code. Um, it's not perfect. And it's something, because I am on the new, uh, new council, I will be looking to address when hiring new elections managers next year. Um, yeah, so that's all I have to say. Um, now that we are done with that stack, we have to um, call the question. Again, that was the motion to call this to question. So Second. is anyone opposed to calling this to question right now? Seeing none, we will call the question now. Dan. No. Alex. Aye. James. No. Naomi. Yes. Bree. Yes. Taylor. No. Chad. No. Mike. No. Alan. No. Paul. No. Gabe. Abstain. Stephanie. The motion fails. All right, I move. Oh, God. sorry, Dan. I motion to adjourn the meeting. All right, there's a motion to adjourn the meeting that has been seconded. Um, Adjournment we'll, motion takes precedent over. Yes, yeah, it does. Motions. Um, we'll just go ahead and run through this real fast. Um, Dan, yes. Alex, substay. James, no. 
Naomi. No. Bree. Taylor. No. Chad. No. Mike. Abstain. Alan. This is on a during the meeting, right? Correct. A uh, yes. Um, we'll go to oh. Gabe. No. And Paul. One moment, please. I think the motion fails, but I just wanted to check with Kenny. Okay, perfect. Is that, it fails. Uh, point of personal privilege. I'm going to withdraw my resolution for next week. Thank you. Um, so that leaves us for our final thing of new business, which is discussing the rest of our term. Do we want to meet for the rest of the term? I'm, I know traditionally we do not meet during finals week slash graduation, which is next week, and then we have two meetings after that. So we're going to open that question up for discussion. Naomi, then James, then Taylor. Um, personally speaking, I really don't think I have the capacity or space for this. Um, I have got accepted into an RU program, an advanced intern, and I'll be doing research. So. I literally don't even get a break this summer, so I would really appreciate if we don't meet because I feel like I'm already on the brink of mental breakdown. Thank you. On to James. Uh, I understand that. I also think, I personally think we should meet to the end um, only because we are paid for the month and our term technically ends in the beginning of June. Um, but I also understand that next week is going to be a chaotic time for a lot of us because it's finals and graduation, so I would almost motion that if we do continue to meet to the end, that maybe just for next week, we don't need to allow anyone who has finals and graduation doesn't have to feel stressed by coming to this as well. But then the last two weeks, we can still meet um, either virtual or in person as we've been doing all year. Marie? I would, um, knowing how our advisors had talked to me at the induction or whatever it was called um, last week about the fact that they can't continue to meet this month with us. If it's voted on to continue the sessions that we should include the fact that we may not have advisors present and just continue without that. Um, Taylor, um, so I, I see the value in meeting since again, we are being paid. But I do want to mention that any resolution can be passed via a Roadrunner link on our teams. So we could always conduct resolutions that way if we so choose. Um, I also don't think that we should meet on MSU graduation out of. Uh, OK, then on Tuesday we are meeting next week. We have our big dinner next week. Yeah, our dinner with um, senior leaders. And that's like a little celebration for us. Um, and food for finals next week. So I, I'm not sure what my opinion is. Does anyone else have thoughts? Um, if we do have one more meeting, the last one that I can do would be not this coming Friday the 12th, but the 19th. Um, I leave for my REU on the 24th. So um, that would be the most viable option for me. If we, we want to re at least meet one more time this month, that would be perfect for me if you guys wanted. Yeah. Alex, then James. Uh, I'm open to meeting except for on graduation. Um, and I know that I didn't get reelected, but um, I can start a committee and then w as a member of the public, I could still be a part of that committee in the future, correct? How how did we go about doing that? I don't remember how we did it. Just started. Okay. 
Um, cool. Well, I, I would like to have at least one more meeting so that way I can start a committee for the arts on campus, including the performative, visual and musical arts. Um, yeah, because typically with funding, those are the first to go. So um, while I'm not here, that is something I'd like to advocate for. Um, now we're going to do Mike then James. So I was just going to motion. It sounds like um, that one more meeting is kind of what we're looking at, just from what I've heard. Um, and the 19th would be probably. Do you want to say something first before I make a motion, James? I want to add on to your motion, but I'll let you finish first. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, but I was going to motion make the 19th our last official meeting. Um, so all bus unfinished business gets con conducted there, and then we um, set off for the summer after that. So. James, so I would motion that next week we do not meet the we have a required meeting the 19th, the week of the 19th, and then the meeting for the 26th can be optional uh, and then all work as far as like. Resolutions, amendments, whatever we want voted on be voted through load on our link um, post the 19th. If we have anything else after that. I second that. Wonderful, we will now go into voting. Yeah, I can take care of it. Um, Dan. Aye. Alex. Aye. James. Aye. Naomi. Aye. Three. Aye. Taylor. Aye. Jane. Sorry, Chad. Aye. Mike. Aye. Did Alan leave? Yes. Okay. Uh, Gabe. Um, Paul. Yeah, Paul's gone. Oh, Paul is gone. Just Gabe. Cool. Gabe. Aye. Okay. Unanimous. And Stephanie's gone, so it is unanimous. That is what we're going to do. Our last meeting will be the 19th, and then the optional meeting the week after that. And of course, we can use Roadrunner League. Amazing. Um, excited to see you all on Tuesday. This concludes our meeting. Have a great weekend.